Um, hello, I'm Randy Trabitz and looking for my script, hold on. Um, I'm one of the producers at Directors Lab West, an all volunteer run organization that every May produces an eight day intensive full of workshops, panels, master classes, and more for emerging and mid-career directors and choreographers from all over the world. Refusing to be thwarted in this, our, our 21st year, we chose to mark the lab with our Directors Lab West Connects and have been overwhelmed by your response and thoughtful questions. So welcome to day two of eight days of conversations crafted for and by theater directors and choreographers live streamed by our partners at Howl Round to their website and to our Directors Lab West Facebook page where you can join the chat, tell us who you are and where you're tuning in from and ask questions for the Q&A following our speaker's conversation. Thank you to Robert Cardoza for providing ASL interpretation and I would like to introduce our speakers. I'm going to start with Jessica Hanno um, while we wait for Ann Bogart to zoom in. I think we're having a few technical difficulties. Jess is a Los Angeles-based director, producer. She's a member of the Kilroys and a co-founder of Bootleg Theater and sits on the board of City Company. Jess. Hello. Welcome. Hello. So I think there's so much to talk about and we can begin with maybe some of the conversations and questions from our robust registration. Um, there's a lot of questions and I know you have trained with City Company and worked with Anne in the past as, as have so many of our viewers. So I thought I'd jump right in and talk about space and which I know is a large part of viewpoints and how you might be reconceiving the notion of space under quarantine, having meetings over Zoom, remote teaching, et cetera. Well, lots of new frames to work in, right? Totally. Um, yeah, it's really, it's very interesting. Uh, I am been thinking a lot about the tools that I have in trying because there's an overwhelming sense of, I don't know, Right? I don't know how to do this. I don't know, this is a whole new form. I don't know, how do I, how do I take what I do and put it in here? Um, so trying when those moments of uh, uh, um, anxiety about the I don't know, I've been trying to tap into the fact that I don't know is a sweet spot for me as a director. Um, and that I do have a lot of skills actually to uh, deal with I don't know. It's the, the it, there's a strange uh, headspace right now because everything is I don't know. So it's like we're swimming in a sea of I don't know. So how do, you know, it's so overwhelming. But then to remember like, oh, I have, I do have ways that I can deal with this or ways that I can find a way through or in because um, through seems far right now. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I mean, the language of that I use in a room or that I use uh, when training. I mean, all of those, that language is super applicable right now. And also like unveiling, you know, duration means something entirely new to me now where, you know, or I mean, repetition, all of these things that I have, I have in my toolbox have a new, or I'm looking at them through a new lens mm -hmm. because of this world of, I don't know. Um, and, uh, I'm finding that helpful and reassuring as I go into these different spaces because um, they are spaces. I mean, that's an interesting way to think about it too, um, to, because you know we say virtual space, but at the same time, I'm physically living in this space, right? So how do I, how do I function both physically and also on this new frame, right? Um, so the, those, the, yeah, I've been, I've had a couple of experiences so far with uh, working uh, like a, a, a reading or workshopping uh, on Zoom. And it is an interesting thing to meet artists where they are, which is in their own space, right? So then having a, th that conversation or knowing that that's where they are um, and trying not to deny that that's where we are, 
um, yeah. but to embrace it um, seems to be helpful. Uh, it's making me have to articulate verbally in a way that um, I often rely on sound effects and physicality to figure out meanings and find my way through. And that is still possible for me in my, in my space, but in terms of conveying and the communication, it's made me have to really figure out how, what be specific with my words, be thoughtful, take my time. Um, oh, and the other thing is to embrace that it's gonna be awkward. Yeah. That also I found uh, uh, in a couple of my experiences so far, those moments of like, oh, this is, you know, not what I want. This is not how it usually goes. Um, to I embrace what you're saying about embracing the I don't know when I have to say a large portion of the questions, not just for this panel, but throughout the week have been akin to what's the future, you know, <laughs> where right. nobody knows and of anybody artists live in that world. Yeah. So, no, it's very true. Yeah. And I mean, you can speak to, you know, one of the, uh, something that I've, I, I took from, uh, and in one of Anne's books, in a director of prepare, she talks about when you don't know as a director to put yourself into action, put yourself into into some move towards the stage is what she actually you know like from the back of the house move in the movement you'll find something whether it's right or wrong who knows but you'll find something to to how have, have that feeling of I don't know maybe dissipate a little bit or like let's figure this out um, so what is the what is that action in this space? What is that moving towards the stage? Like I have to find new ways to do that in, in this kind of communication, um, which is more difficult at times, you know, but also sometimes, you know, get physical actually, but also in terms of, so what is that that is action? So what are actions I can take <clears throat> that are beyond physical? What are the actions I can take in terms of the what, what I'm doing to uh, not just communicate with artists, but to in the creation process or in the beginning stages, what are the actions I can take to support the artists that I would be working with in a room, but now <clears throat> we're separated, but what are my actions, like, can I, can I be a good dramaturg? I mean, I'm really been cracking those skills out in terms of my conversations with playwrights. Um, are you finding this more a time for development, for introspection, or, I mean, this is something we as a community have been talking about a lot, this need to create material immediately and put it out there. Yeah. Or do you feel permission to say, this is, a, this is a moment of repose, this is a moment of what Sheldon called yesterday stillness, which I love. Mm -hmm. I love that too. Um, to kind of really, reorder and understand that maybe there is a shift going on and we might not have any answers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <Right. Okay. laughs> no, this place of um, a, a playwright friend, uh, Maya McDonald, she said to me, invest in the pause. And that phrase um, has been resounding. And also I'm using it to remind myself because I do have I mean, we all have those moments of like, oh, all the projects that I could be doing, or I've always talked about, or now I have the time, we say, but my brain can't focus, or, you know, there's too much from the outside world that I, I'm, I'm thinking about, or that is building up in me, or whatever that is. So the thing about, I love about invest in the pause is that there's a space, there's a space for, there is a space in that phrase for writing the next opus. There's also a space in that phrase for staring at the wall, yeah. you know? I mean, whatever that point is for you right now, I think is the right choice because, because it is so I don't know. Um, and there aren't going to be answers for some time. Yeah. So again, looking at our skills of duration and being able to, um, being able to have to build our own, maybe investing also in our own, uh, what we need to, to carry on the marathon. Yeah. You know, that's the, the what are those, what are the, the things that I need to build up inside of myself or I need to cultivate, you know, in order to get to 
wherever that is. We don't know at this point how far it is, but we know it's far, right? Um, but that doesn't mean stop. And that's the other thing I like about that phrase is the pause as opposed to stop. Yeah, I think you know? that's right. Because I think if you're working a lot, which I know we both have been for the past few years, you um, kind of don't think of yourself often as a creator, as so much as like I, a generator of, I have to keep moving forward. I have to meet a deadline. I have to get through a rehearsal. I have to prepare a class on and on. And this feels like a moment of really stopping to think of, to rethink of yourself as what do I want to, to say? You know, what's yeah. important to really create, um, which is an opportunity. I think directors particularly who are not, you know, kingmakers and, and take assignments as they come are not necessarily in control of that. So it feels like a moment of great power to me, which I think- Oh, is I agree. I mean, I think the possibilities, this moment of possibility is amazing. Um, it is horrific and tr that it comes out of tragedy. Um, and it is also a, a positive. There is, I, I have a hope, a hope because of the way that we are all, I mean, I feel like the accessibility that we have between it has, has, has uh, exponentially increased, both for artists to talk to each other, um, but also to see each other's work in a way. And no, it's never the same as being there live, trust me. I love live theater. It's one of my favorite things to make. It's also one of my favorite things to do and watch. So when I, as I say these things, it is, it is not that anything is a replacement for, right. um, you know, it is a, uh, if nothing else, it's reminding me or, or making me cherish more the things that, that the, when I do miss things, I'm putting them into this thing of like, remember that, remember that for when you get back into a room, remember that when you're sitting in an audience again because we will be. Right. So how to, to, to bring this, these, this um, awakening? <laughs> awakening? I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I don't have the, quite the right word for it. Again, trying to be articulate in this place of like, ooh, what is this? But some, because some words ring really true today and tomorrow they might be a little different because of this, the, this sea change, right? And we still don't, the, the, I can't, haven't been able to put our feet down yet, which I think is okay. I mean, there's that, you know, that wonderful thing about uh, another image that's been in my head quite a bit is um, that moment in the chrysalis where the, the uh, caterpillar goes to goo, right? And you don't know what it's going to be. This, we're kind of in a, in a moment of this. It's very unexpected and forced on us. But, you know, what could we be? What kind of, I mean, what kind of butterfly? Maybe not even a butterfly, right. you know? Maybe it's gonna be something even more glorious. Who knows? Um, but we have that, If it, the, what you're saying too about aligning ourselves with our beliefs, this seems to be a time in terms of our art aligning with our beliefs, also people becoming more aware and invigorated by their communities. Um, in terms of what is, how, how do I want to include my community? How do I want to serve my community? Um, I think artists, I mean, we're speaking of, you know, the tragedy and the, the grief that is, that is a part of this whole event. Artists are gonna be, uh, we are and will be very important to the processing for society of this, giant collective grief. Absolutely. I mean, that, that uh, New York Times uh, cover today, I mean, just, whew. Yeah. Blessings on all of their hearts. I mean, but how, you know, and it, not to say that we all have to make art about Corona. I mean, I don't know, I, I'm, I personally, I get how, like, I don't want, I don't necessarily want to see, want to go see a play about someone stuck in an apartment, like me, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, but, but at the same time, those ideas, those, thoughts about what we are contemplating in this place of, of isolation, those could be helpful in the art. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. 
and it's also a big projection, but how this experience is uh, going to change our relationship to our audience once we are back. I mean, what you said about community, I understand absolutely, but I think not just the artists and what we've been going through and what we want to create, but what um, our community, our audience might be feeling or open to seeing or are they seeing with different eyes now that in a funny way, this kind of Zoom platform is oddly more intimate um, than sitting in the back of a large house? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're right up in everybody's face. So it's an interesting thought um, about how the audience, our relationship to the audience will change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know on certain levels in terms of how this will, in terms of audience with the work, um, I think the accessibility of the work that is coming through this, uh, through online, um, in terms of audience uh, growth and participation, mm -hmm. I think that is really exciting. And I think one of the questions I, or one of the questions I hope we keep in mind or uh, as we move forward is how, what are the things that are resounding with this audience that we have all of a sudden been able to reach in a different way? Yeah. And so what are, what is being able to look towards the, the audience for what, what they're looking for, but also like, what are, how, how do we reflect them back to themselves, which is what our job as artists is. So acknowledging the fact that our audience has expanded in a, in a way, I mean, in a national, international way, just in terms of reach because of online. So then how do we, how do we keep who all those people are, are in mind as we move forward with the stories we want to tell and also the people who, want, who we want to see telling them? Um, you know, I've, I mean, I've been seeing so many um, models of projections of theaters trying to reopen with social distancing and outdoor theaters with little boxes where people go. And I thought to myself often um, as well in preparation for this panel today, it looks like the audience is participating in a viewpoints exercise. <laughs> You know, because now their space has been defined and their way into it and the amount of space they're given and how they can explore it. And I thought, that's so interesting. Now the audience is having a very theatrical experience mm -hmm. as participants just by coming into the space. It's changing the way we think about space, um, which I think is fascinating. I think it's fascinating for people with your training and ants, you know, mm -hmm. to explore that in a, I don't know if it makes it naturally more, just naturally immersive, or if there will be a lot more immersive theater um, for the audience to share their experiences as well. I would not be surprised. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, there are, there are they, I know I know that there are folks making immersive experiences right now um, that you can, participate you know you get pieces of through social media or through some other form of the online online and you are participating you know as in in your world but you're still participating as a group and there's some kind of there is something about the collective experience that is still that is part of theater um, that is still happening um, it's just happening very widespread and we can't we don't get the feedback. I mean, that's the other thing that's so interesting about, about doing work online is that part of, we're, we're not getting the immediate, the immediate feedback, the live, you know, uh, vibe between, you know, Anne actually has this thing about, about the mirror neurons, right? That the mirror neurons are part of what crackle when we're sitting in a dark theater and we're all crackling together. Right, and then the, the recent research about uh, heart, hearts beating together. Right, yeah. so we had so that's part of like again those moments where I'm like, oh, this is one of the things. This put this in the list of things I'm going to be grateful for when I get to sit in the theater again. At the same time, how how is that? Could that be happening right now? And I just am not. I'm not. I'm just not in the vicinity of it right. physically. Right, you know, it's an invisible but, reaction. Right. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I, it's interesting to see people having collective uh, or, or having a having opinion. I'm seeing stuff online 
about plays that people like the like say the National Theater Live. Like I've seen a lot of people talking about the streetcar because they put that one up this week. Right. And you know that so then there's a there's collective converse, uh, conversation happening between that's that's literally across the world as opposed to you know the one you know i mean a very rarefied and sometimes you know elitist version of an audience right because of the access so now all of a sudden we have access into these conversations that are happening about theater that i love and i love seeing these conversations happening amongst people who ne wouldn't necessarily even talk about theater you know but there so so there is something happening it is that 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 i think is it, it it's going to help the possibilities you know in terms of what we're or it reinforce the possibilities give give more fertilizer to that yeah i've been thinking a lot about it, intimate theater which i love mm -hmm. i love being able to actually see every face in the room but the fact that this is a global pandemic you know, it's very much changing my ideas of local mm -hmm. and small and um, and what that is, you know, and I here's a unless you have a comment on that, I'm going to throw a question at you from our okay. from our Facebook room. Um, I'd love to know thoughts about creating smaller theater events with limited audience in intimate non-traditional spaces like galleries, rehearsal studios, and live streaming the event to a broader audience. So that's exactly what we're talking about is yeah. making intimate theater for, for a larger global audience. Absolutely. Um, I'll say, honestly, this is something that I think is already been, it's, it, this is something that people were talking about, right? Or trying. I know there was a company in New York that does uh, streaming. I'm working with a group that we're working on a, a, a Twitch channel that would then support artists that would we will then get to a space. The idea there, but um, and but looking at how can we use this new technology, right? To both in terms of creation in terms of like having rehearsals and things like that, but also how can we include our audience in process possibly, you know, and then is that a way to get people excited, want to, you know, are we doing long form process mm -hmm. that will then for a year that will then lead into a space. Um, I'm really excited. I think, you know, I, 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 this again, I don't know, but I think we will get into smaller spaces first um, outdoor spaces, obviously, first. Um, so this conversation between arts in terms of galleries and uh, ways that you can uh, cr have that crossover and then also have it streamed out so that it's accessible to everyone. I mean, that to me does not sound like a bad thing um, in terms of getting people interested until, until we can get into a space together again, you know? Um, these are all things that are part of part of live theater. We're just yeah. going to do pieces pieces of them at a time. And and obviously, I mean, so many uh, generous companies have been making their archives and their their filmed live productions available during the virus, and so many people have been able to see work that they never would have seen, which I think is extraordinary. It's not the same ever, <laughs> but totally. It is theater. It mm -hmm. is theater. And I think particularly um, if you watch it live with other people at the same time, it does create a little bit more of an experience as opposed to, yeah, I saw that too last week, you know, so, sure. yeah. yeah. I had the extraordinary experience of watching a, a Greg Wohead piece online as part of the GIF Festival at UK. And, you know, it was a durational piece, long, like 15 hours. And so I could dip in and out, you know, which I would have been able to do walk in and out if I wanted, to, you know, in the physical space, but, you know, dip in and out. And there was a moment where I found myself laughing at something sitting in my kitchen. Yeah. And that also like that gave it another level for me in terms of what, in terms of how I was taking in the art, you know, and it's, uh, I think it's fascinating. And I, I, I I want to, I mean, I, I find it all very positive, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I love this question. So I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> Even though I know that it's intended for Anne, but it's, oh. <laughs> but there were so many, but you can do it. There were so many versions of this same question and, um, and they're all about career development and they're all about what would you tell your 20 year old self? What's the one piece of advice you wish you had heard? What, what tips or what challenges did you face, particularly as a young woman coming up? Um, and what helped you in your mindset to continue on to break through if you feel you've broken through, but um, that, it, that gave you the courage to continue. Um, and then there's a, there's a corollary at the end, but I'm gonna let you talk about that. Okay. Um in my 20s. Um, I wish, Eric, I wish, um, I, I guess I wish I would have had more belief in myself and my impulses and my instincts at 20. Um, and I'm, I think that's true of 20s in general. I think that's ex, uh, proves extra true for women. Um, uh, it's, it's a, I mean, I personally was very lucky in that I didn't experience much like door shutting in my face because I'm a non cis male. But I definitely think that a lot of it is in my, it was in my head. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, uh, yeah, I guess that that's the thing I would have said, hey, Jess, you can do this you know, in some form or another. And um, I mean, I still say that to myself, but, you know, but back then I think in terms of where my trajectory was like, as I was very like, what, where, where is my place in this world? I know I, <clears throat> I know I want to make theater. I know I want to, this is what I love, but how, how do I fit into this world? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I think that I try to do as much as possible is to uh, mentor and offer um, or offer space for people to try and fail with with me. Um, and I, w I wish I had had more opportunities like that at a, at a younger age. I did get them, I would say, in my 30s. Um, but if you know if that had happened in my 20s, I think that would have. Uh, I don't. Know, I, well, who knows? But I, that's what I what I really would have. I mean, I think that that kind of support to go for it, um, you know. Certainly a, a generational difference between mm -hmm. my generation and those coming up now is there was an attitude that there was room for one woman at a time. Right. And now right. I think for women to be supportive of each other, to kick the door open, to mentor other young women, it's, um, and to realize it's kind of, if you look at the presenters on this panel, it's very, female heavy um, and those just happen to be the people, you know, so it's, there's a sea change coming. Yeah, I think that, you know, and the more that we, that we all can, like you say, I mean, the each one pull one, the turning to each other and making sure that, that there, you know, it's not, it's not just opening the door. It's not just pulling back the chair. It's literally like, here's the table and like, oh, here's some, and here's some food to eat. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. You know, and what do you think? Of, uh, how do we make this better? So, doing, you know, hoping, hoping for that for myself, but then turning and being like, okay, I'm going to do that for as many people as I can, mm -hmm. because that, um, that's also again how we're going to change this landscape. You know. And what would you say to new directors who are trying to learn their craft now? Uh, during this time, they will forever be the Zoom generation or the, you know, I came up during COVID. It's going to mark people in time, I think, the experience. Well, how to, how to think of that as a, more of a badge of honor as opposed to something that was, you know, I mean, yes, it's been foist upon you. And this is, you know, on so many levels, this is terrible. And, but it, so where, where, how can you make that thing that is going to define, quote unquote, this generation, how can you make that something positive and good and, um, 
help to move the culture forward. I mean, that's, that seems, it seems like there's going to be, I mean, there's stuff that, I mean, I'm going to have to, I mean, I'm learning at the same time as there's going to be ways that minds that are younger and more and more adept at, at the, at technology period than yeah. myself are going to do amazing, innovative things are doing amazing, innovative things. You know, I don't know if, did you get to, do we talk about this? Did you get to see the Peter Quo directed, um, in Love and Warcraft that he did with the ACT MFAs. There was, a, it was a, you had the RSVP, it was a project. Yeah. But the, the, the way that he, the way that he directed, I mean, and, and literally, and like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, you know, no, this is directed. This was choreographed, blocked, worked on, I mean, uh, the script was worked on, the scenes were there, you know, and was it, li no, it was not live. And it was not that, but it was so exciting to see someone using their directing skills to help tell the story in this medium. Absolutely. And that is absolutely possible. It gave me a lot of hope. And, you know, it, it also gave me, you know, it's just like, oh, that's a, and also the reality, that's a lot of work. And it's a lot of work that like, you know, I don't wanna, <laughs> because that's not how we do it. Right. But, you know, it was pretty revelatory. And so we're going to have to, maybe that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have to work outside my box. I'm going to have to work harder in cer certain ways. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to have to feel awkward. And that is not what I wanted to be feeling at this place in my career. Right. But that's what it is. Historically, we've gone through at least, you know, kicking and screaming in terms of accepting new technologies before, mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, when computer boards came into the booth, and no longer was it a connection between the operator. It was just go, go, go. Right. It was an adjustment. So, you know, I think we're all capable of moving forward. And I, I agree with you that those people that have grown up with a digital universe at their fingertips are probably more capable, certainly, than I am at yeah. making the adjustment. Lots of, lots of questions about commerce. And um, sure, yeah, so not just about how do we get paid as artists, but interestingly, you know, are we should be we be wary about making work that we're just giving away, giving it away? Mm -hmm. Have we started to devalue ourselves um, by by loading things free up onto the web? And this concern about I think it's an interesting one. Obviously artists have to survive and make a living, but I'm also concerned about devaluate, devaluing what our contribution actually is. Um, this is a hard one because I wanna say, I mean, on, I mean, I have personal beliefs I mean, or personal ways that I would, I, I follow. But at the same time, I don't want to deny any artist that like, oh, don't, you shouldn't be putting that up there or don't, you know, it's like, I mean, every, again, invest in the pause. Everyone's going to be having their own take on this. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we do need to be careful about in terms of um, ownership, especially in terms of playwrights, be very like, and be very uh, uh, respectful. Of of playwrights and their rights and their stories, um, and their play. I mean their plays, but to be hopefully in conversation with those playwrights about what um, what we how how we can find some kind of either either mm, I don't know happy medium maybe but also maybe there's something about like this the play that we were going to be working on we're going to put that over here because we won't we, it it we want it to be live. We want it to be in a space. That's what we want this to be. And to like run for like, got to put something up. That feels like I would, I would question that energy um, in terms of like, what is the why of why you need to do that? So, so quickly, fast, maybe without having everyone, all of the artists working in mind. Um, because I, and I understand that, that, rush need oh but maybe there's a moment of hey let's just uh maybe quiet it down a little bit and let's look at why we want to tell this story 
is there is this is there another way to tell this story in this medium that is that would work in tandem with the play is there you know that there, I think there are a lot of possibilities, but being respectful of all of the artists involved, and especially when it comes to the commerce part of this. And I know that, you know, we're all looking for ways to support ourselves and find ways to, to make it to however long this is until we can get back into a, a room, right? So I would also encourage everybody to look at what their skills are and how else we can use them yeah. in terms of, in terms of commerce and not to say that you're not gonna, you know, make money as a director ever again, but there's this period of time where I, you know, you do something else for a little while while you keep cultivating and working with artists and things like that. But the idea of being able to support yourself by making theater is just not happening right now. And I think to acknowledge that and to, you know, to mourn it and at the same time not get bogged down and lost in in that place. Um, and finding, yeah, go please. So no, well, I'm trying to, oh my God, I think Anna's here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let me quickly, I see her name. I'm looking for her face. Let's but see. while she's coming in, I want to Hi, Anne. We're so delighted that you're here. Um, theater and opera director Anne Bogart, professor at Columbia University and co-artistic director of the City Company, as well as author of five invaluable books on directing viewpoints, theory, and the practice of making theater. I'm going to get out of here quick so you can have a conversation with Jess and share your thoughts with us. And I'll be back at the end. I think we've had enough questions. We wanna hear what you have to say. But, but wait, let me ask you, I have a question. This starts in 15 minutes, right? No, we, I, think, I think our international time warp has messed us up. We are live right now. And how long have you been live? Since our 11 o'clock, so the Which last is... 30, 35 minutes ago or so. Oh no, that's, I'm so sorry. It's okay. When I thought I was, I thought I was uh, actually 19 minutes early. <laughs> I think everyone will be delighted to have you stay for as long as you can stay. So, what have you been talking about? So many things. Um, so many things. We well, we, we, we talked about, we, we covered a lot of the, um, or, or we talked about some of the, we took some of the questions from, uh, that were uh, in the, the, the RSVP responses. So let's see, we've talked about, we've talked about being in a sea of I don't know, and knowing that we have some tools to uh, get us through that because we're directors and I don't know is exciting. Um, we've talked about being in these spaces and what, what some of the, some of our, uh, uh, the way that we have, uh, we have tools we have and things we have been able to use and not use, what, the, what our feelings are about being in these spaces. Um, what else have we talked about? Uh, talked about being a woman and coming up. Yeah. And, and what uh, some advice that I would have given myself back in the day, which was to believe in myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally. Uh, and then also about mentoring and bringing up and opening up spaces for other people. We've talked about the accessibility that is now happening. I because missed of all the great video. subjects. <laughs> I, I have to say, to, to, again. to have, whoever is listening, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, I was looking forward to this, and I'm, and I thought I was so early. Yeah, we, we can take a little more time, I think. So I think yeah. we're fine on the other end. Yeah. I'll double check that and um, cue you but if there's a problem. I really apologize. I'm not sure. I, I, I thought we had worked it out that it was eight o'clock. London time. Seven o'clock London. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a perfect West indication Coast, let's, of let's, how this is a new platform for all of us and we're gonna have some glitches. So we're oh, delighted. It, it looks like we, we do have, we, we don't have a heart out. At, no. At, so we can keep talking. If, yeah, we have as like, much time as okay. you have. Yeah. But I probably will apologize five more times because, um, <laughs> I mean, I have been on Zoom a lot. It hasn't been, uh, I haven't been, it's not that it's new software or anything for me. So 
No, it's not that. I'm I think it's it's the time difference for sure. I mean, I yeah. think we had we had a we had a glitch on the West Coast versus uh what are you on GMT? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Well, oh. we're delighted you're here, Anne, and please, I'm going to let you chat with Jessica. Well, thank you, and I'll do my best to make up for it. <laughs> I'm not well, worried. Well, you want to talk, do you want to talk about the space that we're all in right now, um, in terms of the work, how, how we work in this, in these new frames that we are in? Yeah, I will talk about what's been on my mind mostly, and I know, Jessica, you heard me talk about this the other day, which is that when we first were shut in, which is um, a significant thing for all of us theater people, because what we do is we deal with social systems and suddenly we're <clears throat> isolated from one another. And in the beginning, I was very frustrated with the amount of, of publication that was happening online, the amount of you know coronavirus dances and, and, and readings and this and that. And I, I kept thinking, you know, it feels like self-expression to me. And that's not really what the theater is about. And uh, it wasn't until a few weeks into it when I was discussing this with, with Tina Landau and she said, no, 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 you're wrong because actually every, everything that's happening is great because it's a form of mourning. This is how people are mourning. And so I, I I realized she was right, but I do wanna take apart a little bit what my frustration was, is that I, I'm so uninterested in self-expression. And I think as a, as a country, we are obsessed with the signature, the original vision, the you know having something to sell, the branding, et cetera. And yet the theater is something that is really not self-expression. It's actually, if anything, it's eulogy. It's actually giving, giving voice to dead people. It's looking back and remembering and actually allowing them to enter into us and to speak through us. And so certainly there's a frustration in not being able to be together sharing space this way. But, um, uh, uh, but I, I started thinking about it and I started thinking about um, prisoner of war camps. Mm -hmm. And how in, in Vietnam and during the Second World War in um, China and in Japan, the pr American prisoner of wars, prisoners of war figured out a system of tapping where they would be separated and enforcement, enforced not to actually speak to one another. And so they figured out a very elaborate way of tapping to one another, either through the walls or against the pipes and they figured out elaborate messaging systems that would go from one cell to another. And I thought ultimately that is interesting because it's one person trying to reach out to another or a group of people trying to stay together amidst horrifying circumstances. And I started looking at the output that was online of people dealing with the, 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 the shut-in coronavirus COVID issue. And I noticed there was a difference between that sense of tapping, like, are you there? Do you hear me? And I have something to say, then just kind of showing off, or we're gonna do a reading because we're doing a reading, we just have to keep going. So although I think Tina was right in saying it's all a form of mourning, I think in these particular moments, we need to actually use the stop, use the energy of the stop, as when you have the brakes on and the accelerator on at the same time mm -hmm. and be ready to move, which we're gonna to have to move with great alacrity and great ingenuity and great sense of innovation because to get back to one another is, gonna, is going to require us all to engineer way, new ways of being together. But that notion of tapping was really helpful. In other words, I think this event is important, which is why I'm so horrified at being 40 minutes late, as I thought 20 minutes early. Um, but I do feel, I'm looking at Jessica right now, I'm sort of tapping at her. And can we talk about something of substance? Can we, can we um, communicate to one another? I don't know, Jessica, are you feeling that also in your, in your home? Yeah, I mean, yes, I do in terms of, um, it's also something about the intention of the tapping in yeah. terms of what you're, in terms of what you're speaking of um in uh, cuz there's there is something the the survival 
that is implied or in, import or implied in the tapping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I think I I I I see I see that energy from people. Yeah. In terms now, of what's coming out. So so it's important to have something to say when you're tapping. You've got to have something to communicate, something useful for others, not just to expose yourself. And so I was thinking lately about, you know, something I actually heard Robert Brewstein um, say, the amazing Bob Brewstein, who's getting quite old right now, but he wrote a lot of books that are hard to read and wrote one that was is too easy to read. It's, he wrote one to young actors that is just ridiculous. Anyway, but I adore him. And he founded Yale Rep and ART, et cetera. And he said at one point, and I thought it was something wise, he said, to do theater, you need three things. You need passion, you need to have something to say, and you need to have technique. Mm. And I thought that's really useful. And it made me think of like a three-legged milk stool, you know, that if one of the legs is missing, the whole enterprise falls over. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's interesting now, thinking about how we communicate with one another uh, in this interim liminal space before we are allowed to be back together in full glory of, of, of gathering. But um, Yes, we have passion. I definitely feel that. I can feel it coming across uh, the internet. We definitely have things to say. There's a lot to say. But what we don't necessarily have is the technique, is, is the new techniques, in a sense, that can uh, help us join with one another, the new techniques that, um, that, that, that we're awkwardly learning to use right now to be able to tap. We have to figure out a code in this tapping. Yeah. And I also think that probably when we are released from this prison of, of um, sequestration, it won't be easy. We won't be able to play by the same rules for a while. And we won't be able to use the same techniques for a while. So we have to go through a very awkward phase of attempting to connect with one another uh, and, and to find the new techniques, to find the new techniques in order to do so. And perhaps when we can gather together again in the glorious way that theater allows, perhaps we will uh, we'll have new tools that we can bring to, to, the, to play. You know. Can you speak, because I, I said earlier that we have to be uh, comfortable being awkward or that's one because I, I have found I have found this in my dealings with this new medium to mm -hmm. be awkward in the in the in a creation sense or in a yeah. communication sense in terms of a rehearsal room. Um, how 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 are you finding in terms of like how is it to revel in the awkwardness? <laughs> to well, it's not a, it's it's not <laughs> only awkwardness; it's also uncertainty. Mm. That we have more uncertainty. There was a beautiful article in the New York Times today. It was actually an editorial about how human beings don't actually have a clue. And to ask experts to predict what the future is, is ridiculous right now. We will figure it out. The experts will be able to move and we'll be able to move in, in the right moment. But to say, I want a guarantee of how it's going to be, is there, there's nothing, that's not possible. And we should stop right. expecting it. But what we do need to do is to learn to be more comfortable with uncertainty, to, to learn what the neuroscientists have been saying for the last 20 years, which is you actually have very little to do with uh, controlling your life or the world around you. You think you do, but in fact, you just nodded, thinking now that you nodded because you agree, but you nodded and then you agreed. You know, that's what we learn with the neuroscience, which is interesting in the theater, certainly in terms of behavior. So certainly there is the um, embrace of uncertainty, but there's also the, uh, as you say, the awkwardness. And I, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening with City Company right now, yeah. which is interesting. We're, we're uh, involved in something called Workspace. It's something we've been doing for a number of years as we work on different projects at the same time. And as soon as we, we were in, um, in Minneapolis performing uh, the, the Bakai. We had just opened it, big production. It's gonna have a nice long run. And then the next thing we were gonna do is to go to Singapore for another long six weeks to work on the three sisters there. And then we were gonna to go to Saratoga. Well, like everybody else, all of that was pulled out beneath us. And through the uh, genius 
of, uh, of our staff, Michelle Preston and her staff at City Company, uh, who figure out a way to make applications very quickly to various uh, funding organizations that are dealing with the fallout from COVID, we are able to keep the actors on salary through June, uh, it, it, through May into June, once we were shut down from, from Minneapolis and people came home. And so we are five days a week on Zoom and trying to figure out what training means. Mm. And all of us feeling rather stupid to be standing in your <laughs> living room on your stupid carpet trying to do stomping or trying to do viewpoints on the, or trying to rehearse a play. And it feels sometimes, um, as you said, uh, awkward. It feels, um, is this necessary? But we're trying, we're trying to find out what it is that is necessary, how to connect with one another, how to uh, stay connected how to rehearse a play, how to be together, how to be together, be together well in the way that we're able to do in a room together, but what now? So it is, Jessica, completely awkward. <laughs> how are you fighting through your frustrations? I mean, in terms of, I mean, I know that, that, that a lot of us are trying to figure out how is it about, is about just stick with it, keep trying, I mean, you know, how, how, what are some of the ways that you are fi or fi finding to support your fortitude well, to keep going? Frustration is an interesting fuel. And it's <laughs> not just because of COVID that we're frustrated. We mm -hmm. have frustration at every step. That's part of our lives. That's what part of making art in the United States or anywhere is very, very difficult. So with frustration, you can do one of two things. You can either discharge, which means complain, <laughs> or you store the frustration. And again, this is not just in this moment, you, you compress it. Mm. You don't let it make you sick because it could make you sick. You say, this is interesting fuel and you wait and it doubles its energy. And then at the right moment you express in the right form, you tap mm -hmm. correctly, you tap audibly, that's, that's, that, that's hearable to others. And so I don't think we should think of frustration just in this particular situation, that all, all circumstances have a degree of frustration. I do think that probably after we start moving out of our homes and try to work together, I think it will feel in some ways socially what the Eastern Europe felt politically. In other words, mm. there will be many, many rules that aren't political, but that are social that we have to live up to that are very frustrating. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. just distance is frustrating. Frustrating with dealing with people who don't respect distance. You know, So that right. frustration is going to escalate. So we bloody well, I, I'm here in London, so I say things like bloody well. We bloody <laughs> well uh, should figure out how to, how to handle the frustration and treat it as a gift of energy mm. and not let it injure you, but let it become a useful, useful tool. And not to think it's just because we're stuck in our houses. That's, that's not, not correct. So. Yeah. It's definitely shining. It's shining a light on things that were already there for sure. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a new, in a, in seeing them in a new way. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, I mean, I think, I think it, it's it's going to be very difficult. But the things that we're failing are going to fail, and the things that we're succeeding are going to succeed. That's terrifying on a political level because I'm terrified that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because that was happening very successfully for some people is going to intensify. That's what we have to fight against. But I do think that there are certain aspects of the theater that, that we're struggling mm -hmm. and that we're gonna have to reinvent. The probably the biggest, um, uh, I'm thinking of word in, 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 in German, opfer, the biggest uh, uh, sacrifice in a sense will be the large regional theaters because I think commercial theater will kick its way back into existence. Small theaters, the ones who are smart 
then the ones who are thinking fast and are being innovative will be okay because they can go from an office of 10 to an office of two pretty easily, but they're used to doing that. Mm -hmm. So not to say there's not gonna be a lot of uh, sacrifice in the small theater world, but I think the really big regional theaters are gonna have a lot of trouble because they are, they've been swollen to a point that many are run by their marketing directors anyway, rather than the artists. You know, that's a, that whole history of that. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be very difficult for I think the yeah. larger theaters. I yeah, sort of true. got off track of what we were talking about, but. Mm, that's okay, we're, 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 we'll come back around. Well, yeah, this yeah. thing of, of being able to, um, the we were talking, I, I, I love the possibilities of this moment. Um, and the fact that we that the landscape of our the theatrical ecosystem is I mean it's devastating and also the place we are in this place of change and so how how are how are we as we as artists who who create and are usually you know we're looking for support from institutions is there another is there another way that we can reach out maybe more horizontally and uh, to each other in terms of how we support each other and make our work going forward. Well, that's already happening. It's happening right now as we're speaking. It's happening because I was impressed because uh, Randy sent me a lot of the questions which are amazing and serious questions and very uh, thoughtful questions. I think we are reaching out to each other. I think we're reaching bigger audiences than we've ever had before because we're actually using the internet in new ways. We're certainly using Zoom and discovering other tools to do that. So we're actually intensifying uh, social distance. Uh, actually, I think social distancing is, is a misnomer. It should be physical distancing. Physical we, distancing. There is a great deal of social great intimacy that. happening right now and a great deal of what you call horizontality more than ever. I remember first when, when I was first confronted with having to say teach classes for at Columbia on Zoom, I was horrified. I think this is never going to work. But somehow, I'm not saying I was able to teach directing necessarily on Zoom. Uh, the students, the directing students made jokes about, yeah, we're going to be doing everything with puppets now right on tables. <laughs> so, but, but what did happen is a deeper communication, a deeper uh, uh, dedication to one another a feeling I feel very much both for a city company and also for my students, I need to be there for them. I'm also on the board of uh, the executive board of the uh, SDC and it's been an extraordinary uh, honor to be with this group of people who have all come together and made a hundred committees because there's now thousands of directors out of work suddenly. And suddenly we have to organize and we have to think in new ways and we have to think about what safety means returning. We have to think about how to use the, the, the media. We have to think about the fact that a lot of regional theaters, as they say, are suffering and they want to actually take old material and, and, and um, broadcast it. And they're calling a lot of directors and saying, I'd like to use this uh, this video from your production in, in 2015, can I do that? And you want to say, yeah. yeah, but you also know that it's a, uh, it's a video that was taken by one camera at the back of the house because equity doesn't approve of shooting a, a performance and all the actors look like little blurs and the sound system is horrible. Is that what we want to show to audiences around the country? Wouldn't that turn people off? rather than uh, right. get people excited. I mean, it's not like we're like the National Theater or the Met Opera, you know, uh, where, where we have like six cameras. So what mm -hmm. the questions that are coming up now are really um, key and vital to all directors. And so we have to talk to each other. We have to use a collective brain. And I think my puppy's about, you're gonna meet Mabel. Oh. Come on, come on, say hello. Come on. <laughs> this is Mabel. She's a Aww. puppy. Hi, Mabel. Aww. Oh. <laughs> she wants to say hello. Yes. Aww. Boy, being with a puppy during this time is such a, a, a wonderful thing because a puppy is just there and there and there and always there and there again. Just very present. Hey, yeah. I have a treat for you. Go, go eat this treat. <laughs> oh, she wants to eat it up here. Okay. Exactly. Watch me eat the treat. 
<laughs> she, she will perform for us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome visitors, you know, I mean, that's again, in this, it, we have a moment of live, these moments of live yeah. on a screen yeah. is also very interesting to me because it's, uh, there, there, you know, it, 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 you know, it's not live theater, but there is something happening that's live. So let's. Well, you know I mean, what it is, Jessica? Hmm. It's very simply we're sharing time, ah. sharing space in a very, very different way, in a virtual way, but we are sharing time mm -hmm. for for those who are present in this moment. It's different when you get a, a video that was shot a few days ago and look at it again; it feels more archival. But to be here, I'm looking at you, and Zoom is really improved over Skype, I have to say. I'm seeing you smile, I feel better. Right. That painting behind you is making me a little giddy. Yes. Maybe I'm thinking of <laughs> drugs or something, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, so I think it's, we do share time. Space is a problem. Yes. But time definitely. I love that. I hadn't, I, I actually, honestly, I hadn't put it together like that, but I, I yeah, I love that because there are these, I was, I, I do have these moments of feeling uh, the collective still the of an, of being in an audience right. um, even though I'm not necessarily in the same room with people um, the conversations that people are having about theater that either sometimes like theater that I've seen in the past like um, the 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 encounter uh, Simon McBurney from Cl Complicite they put that up this week and so then to be able to hear people having conversations about a play that I saw a couple three years ago and was deeply moved by you know, and I get to watch it again in a different way, which is also interesting. Um, but then also that that there is this conversation about art that I'm very excited about because it's uh, it seems again the accessibility, the way that people are able to to get to uh, uh, these the theater that they wouldn't have been able to get to, both in a space financially, all of all of those things um, that that is causing a collective uh, group experience in yeah. some form or another, which is, yeah, I'm feeling that I, is a major part of theater right now. It is, and it's a huge part. You know, it's, it's about sharing in a sense with one another. It's about social systems. But the one thing that's missing and we're not very good at yet, and Lord knows if we should become good at it, is to make something that is really uh, uh, formidable, like you hope when you work on a play, you're creating an experience that just mm. shakes and that the audience has to actually handle themselves to come to it and to join it and to use their imagination. That we haven't quite figured out. So we've, I think we've, got, we've had an acceleration in social, the opposite of social distancing is we have social interactions happening and interactions as well. Mm. But what we haven't figured out how to do is to build things and to build these um, uh, these works of art, mm. to put it simply, you know. It's and, well, and, and the question is, do we need to? We're, I mean, we're going to be out of Zoom at some point. What are we taking with us? Certainly, but but do we need to create something on Zoom? Is that or on online, is that what we do? Isn't that what other people do? I mean, it's a it's a question, isn't it? Yes. I don't know if you what your thoughts about that is. Um, I I, I, mean, I have I have I have similar thoughts, or because um, uh, I think I'm very curious about this for process. I I am I I am wary of it about in terms of production for like a paying audience. Um, I, I, I have been able, I have seen a couple of, uh, pro, uh, I guess, produced for Zoom, but they were private um, and they were exciting and I learned a lot. Um, but I don't know that I'm, I'm really excited about making, a, 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 trying to translate a theater production to this form. I am curious about how we can continue to create in this place that will then get us to a space. Um, I think, I mean, I know that like companies um, that have been using technology and been able to over, over in the past, I mean, already, are, were already doing this because they had members in other countries. Like you say, 
this is better than Skype. So we're already, you know, we're, we're moving forward in that, but there are a number of, you know, there are a number of pieces out there that were created via this medium. We go and we see them in a theater. They weren't necessarily meant to be seen like this. And then there are also, I mean, then there's also just the use of this technology within a piece. I mean, uh, the way that cameras have been started to be used on stage as, um, oh, what is her name? The wonderful director, they had her at Red Cap. Marianne Weems. Yes, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah, so like- and the Builders how, Association, yeah. In how you how you how you how you bring those uh, those el those elements that are, are that we have already started to try to develop and use, um, and how to bring that these in, I mean I don't we'll, we will be probably forever talking about the boxes right the boxes will become part of our language of expression in some form or another whether it be in the theater or in television or wherever the wherever that goes this is not, I mean, we are all using this frame in such a way that it's, it's not going to just disappear, you know? Yeah, you know, there's a, a book that was written like at least 10 years ago by Thomas Friedman, who's a red, writer, editorialist, and it was called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. And I find it very, I found it instructive then, and right now I'm thinking about it again. And the Lexus means like the car of the Lexus, and the mm -hmm. olive tree means ancient culture. And he said, and this is 10 years ago or more, and he said, you know, we're, we, we're living in a world where people are going to extremes, either to all technology, the Lexus, or fundamentalism to ancient religion, to, to the olive tree, which, is, which can be very restrictive. And his point was that both of them, uh, you lose your soul, hmm. you lose something. And that his theory is, is that the balance between the Lexus technology and the olive tree or, or ancient culture needs to be brought together. At the time he said, you know where it's happening the best in the world? Said the South of France, you have these incredible countryside and then you have a high speed train running through it. You know, <laughs> thinking of that in terms of the theater is that um, I'm thinking of certain artists who have, have embrace technology so much that the, that, the, uh, that, that the art went down the drain hole, that suddenly it feels so distant, you know? And so I think you can go too far into technology. And I've always thought, but at the same time, you don't want to deny technology. You don't want to deny their, their amazing sound system possibilities or amazing lighting possibilities, you know, all this technology. And now certainly the technology of Zoom but I think the healthy thing is to uh, find a balance. So I know the way I've worked for years is that I always was aware that if there was gonna be really, really high tech sound, I needed to have a stage that was basically a platform, a wooden platform. Or, or if I was gonna do something mm -hmm. that involved something scenically complicated, I had to really simplify and make acoustic the other elements. And so I think that might be instructive as we move out of isolation to say, what have I learned technically? How can I use it, but also bring back the, the meat, you know, the, mm -hmm. the wood, the, the ancient part of what the theater is, you know, the, the incarnate experience. And I think that will make the most successful theater, if you know what I mean. I do. I love that idea. The yeah. balance. Yeah. Finding that balance. Yeah. So you actually have to be conscious. Mm -hmm. oh. of how you choose as we right. leave these platforms and start standing together, being together. What, what do you keep and then how do you start to balance the, the ancient side of the mm -hmm. theater in a sense? Mm -hmm. I'm back. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Um, you guys are awesome. I just thought, and especially big kudos. I'm not awesome. I'm an hour late. <laughs> no, but let's have a moment of acknowledging Robert, our ASL interpreter. Done way more than he bargained for. Um, yeah. I just have a couple of hot questions off the Facebook page, and um, hopefully we can scooch those in. I think we have a few minutes left. Um, one is vis-a-vis -vis what you were just talking about, and there's questions from how do we 
create theater in this new space without devaluing design elements. You know, this is our first time as Director's Lab going outside of our usual small cloistered audience. And so we have a lot of people from all different facets of the theater world tuning in, obviously, including a, a lighting designer in this case, um, who feels a little left out of the conversation, understandably so. And I'm just curious what you think about. Well, first of all, it's a great question, whether it comes from a director or a lighting designer. And all great questions have the same answer. So would you ask the question again? And I'm gonna give you the answer. Awesome. Um, how do we create theater in this new space without devaluing design elements? Or is my work- the answer, And the answer theater? is, the, the answer is, so that's it, that's a great question. The answer is exactly. You have to ask the question. If you don't ask it, then, that, then, then you're in trouble. Who knows? We're going to find out how to make that work, but you have to ask the question. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's how do we work together again? How do we use what it is we can do? So that question is more valuable than any answer I could possibly give. Awesome. Um, and this last one more before we're going to go to our final question that we're asking all of our panelists this week. I'm just curious about your, um, your take on being part of the academic world at this moment. And I know that you're still teaching at Columbia as a, and I'm teaching as well. And I feel like there is, especially for the incoming class um, who are looking forward to at least a semester, if not a year of remote learning in theater, um, a kind of, acknowledgement or ethical conversation that I'm not hearing yet about training for something that is looking precarious in terms of their futures? Well, a couple of things. Because I teach directing, it's a little different for actors, but because right. I teach directing, I revel in my own graduate training, which was performance studies. It wasn't actually called it then. I went to NYU, got an MA, which was then a two year program in what was then called theater history and criticism. And it was the best preparation for being a director I can imagine. So I don't think that we're not gonna to be together for the entire year. I do think we're gonna be on Zoom for the first semester. So what Brian Kulik, who's uh, I co-run the, the directing program, the graduate directing program at Columbia, what we're gonna do is take the first semester to basically give a performance studies approach to theater. And it will be all super academic. I'm gonna teach a course I've never taught before called the history of directing. And uh, I better start working on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be, I think, fantastic. And I hope to give the students um, everything that I was able to get from my own graduate studies. And what that was, was an appetite for study. In other words, in two years, I couldn't possibly read. It was, it was, a, it was a program that was uh, then run by uh, Richard Schechner and, and Ted Hoffman and Brooks McNamara, you know, these amazing people. And so it was about the anthropology, sociology in relationship to theater, as opposed to, you know, the strongest line on stage is a diagonal and make a right. joke often. The strongest line on stage is diagonal, poof, you have your MFA. <laughs> so in some way I can, that Brian and I, and Brian is much more um, of a brilliant, brilliant um, academic than I am, but is to uh, spend a serious and rigorous semester uh, uh, and concentrate on, ac uh, on academic study, on historical study, on rigorous uh, uh, theoretical study. And then in the spring, when I believe we will be back, that's, I think that's gonna happen, is to do a lot of production. Like enough, enough talk, enough study, enough writing, enough reading, let's get it on the boards. We've never done that before. Usually we try to over the course of their two years of training and then their one year of, of no training, but making theses and internships, we usually sort of weave all that through and very carefully make sure that by the time they're finished, they, they have that background, yeah. but we're gonna stuff it all in. And um, 
Uh, the other thing that really surprised me, and I don't know if you found that with your students, is the students who are now moving into their second year and the incoming students, for the most part, are so relieved they're not in the job market. They're mm -hmm. so happy to be in school and relieved to actually have this time of grace. And that's another way of looking at it. And I, I realized, I thought, oh, right, I get that. It is a, it is a, a special time for them, I think. And I think that you have to, if you're gonna go into this kind of study and teaching, you have to think that way. You have to say, I'm gonna line myself up so that it's working for me and for the world at, uh, uh, in general, for the, my use, usefulness in the world rather than against it. That's great, that's helpful. It's very, um, it's very humbling this whole time to be- oh, Yeah, it is. Here especially. Um, and in, in my case, my, so many of my students are straddling the job market while they're in school and, yeah. you know, in small multi-generational homes. And it's, it's a balancing act for them to, you know, find a quiet space with good broadband to stay in school. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of balls in the air, you know. Those I, are real obstacles. I mean, the financial obstacles are so huge. 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 Yeah. Um, and it's ma it's made me as as the I feel more responsible to the students than ever. I mean, we're keeping in touch all summer long, which I never usually do. You know, yeah. we're we need each we need to be there for each other. I think. Yeah. No. And what's important is they need to know that we're going to do this together, and I mean that in general in the field. It's not that it's not like, oh, you young people have to figure it out. It's no, we're gonna get in the trenches and we're gonna all figure it out together. We're gonna figure out how to move forward, so. Yeah, I agree with you. It's been a balancing act between being a therapist sometimes in the classroom, you know, and the compassion and still trying to push forward to get something of value out of the, out of the subject. Yeah, so. yeah. I'm gonna ask you our stock last question. Um, if I can find it in my multiple <laughs> scripts here. <laughs> it can't be that stock then, can it? <laughs> and I think I actually wrote it, but it's been an unexpected <laughs> morning. So in closing, could you briefly share something you've learned or discovered during this quarantine period that you plan to incorporate in your practice as an artist? And Jessica, do you wanna go first or me? I'll go first. Okay. Um, I think this, uh, uh, the, the, I would like to, I, I hope to take forward this accessibility to my community, to my fellow artists. Um, this, uh, the conversation that is happening because of that accessibility. I'm really hoping that we, that we don't, and once, once I move into, into spaces or um, that the, 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 the wall, those actual, like the actual walls don't, don't become walls of, of communicating in terms of my, my awareness and my curiosity about the whole, the whole landscape and the, and the whole community. That's what I hope, I think. Great. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, I would say, I would say to myself, when this is changing, I'm not gonna say when we're back because I think we'll never be back, is to say what I've learned is to slow the fuck down. <laughs> we've, been, we've been going faster and faster yeah. over the last 30, 40 years. The, the pulse and the time signature of our world has sped up to a place that is inhuman and inhumane. And I would just want to repeat, slow the fuck down. And printing t-shirts as we speak. <laughs> slow the fuck down. That'd be great t-shirt. It really would be. <laughs> and Bogart on tempo, slow the fuck down. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Jess. And especially thank you, Robert. 
you've been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I just once again say I'm so sorry about this time screw up. It's I actually, I think horrible. our viewers got double, double, <laughs> double for their money, which was free anyway. So we're, it all worked out and we're delighted. Um, we also want to acknowledge our longstanding partners at Stage Directors and Choreographers Society, the Pasadena Playhouse, Boston Court Pasadena. We look forward to reuniting with them next year. Uh, we hope you'll join us again tomorrow for an amazing conversation between Ann Janes and Carly Weckstein, who will be discussing using intimacy direction to, teach, to create a culture of consent post COVID. Thank you for being with us today. And we hope this conversation sparks a whole lot more. Farewell. Thank you guys. Sorry. No, oh. you're great. <laughs> Don't you worry. And video out, mute out. Here we go.